Hello and uh, welcome to the Gender Equality Academy webinar series. My name is Vasya Desi and I am the coordinator of the Gender Equality Academy project. Today we have the pleasure to uh, actually have you on our second session of the webinar Gender Equality in Responsible Research and Innovation, which is co-organized with two uh, Horizon 2020 projects, Etna and uh, GIGO project. Before we start with the, the main presentations, I would like to let you know a few more words about uh, what Gender Equality Academy does. So, what is the challenge that uh, we're trying to tackle in Gender Equality Academy? At the moment, we understand that there are many gender equality programs, many projects and a great gain knowledge. But at the same time, uh, the gender analysis remains rarely appropriated within research projects. There is a small proportion of researchers and practitioners that are familiar with the theoretical and methodological concepts of gender and feminist scholarship. And there are still large differences among research performing organizations in various countries. So what the project does is that Gender Equality Academy develops and implements a high quality capacity building program on gender equality in research and innovation and higher education. Under the results of this project, we are offering uh, training sessions in different formats and we are now able, due to COVID-19, to offer uh, interactive webinars, summer schools in online format, train the trainer sessions, an open collaborative online course and training section sessions that we're trying to be as interactive as possible um, as workshops are. Uh, we are uh, a consortium of partners with a strong experience in uh, training materials and uh, we are all over Europe. Uh, you may find today's session on our YouTube channel, Gender Equality Academy uh, EU. It will be recorded and it will, it will be uploaded uh, very soon and you can find also our past webinars and past sessions. Um, also, uh, with the dissemination info, we are coming, um, two sessions are coming up soon. There is a virtual roundtable on engaging men in gender equality uh, work in research organization and one for February on acting against sexual harassment in academic and research organizations that you can find on our website. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. This is a very short uh, information about Gender Equality Academy. Uh, we are live tweeting, so you can join us with your tweets and your impressions on the G Academy Twitter. And without any further delay, I will give the floor to my colleague Maria San Giuliano, who will present the agenda of the day. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, Vasia, for. Uh, your introduction. Let me just um, share my screen now. Can you see it? Um, let's put it in a presentation mode. So, um, uh, I'm uh, happy to introduce today's uh, webinar. My name is Maria San Giuliano. I'm the research director of Smart Venice. Uh, we are one of the G Academy partners and we are in charge of uh, the um, um, webinar uh, series of the G Academy as well as the e-learning component, e-learning course, the doc. Um, I'm here today with my colleague, uh, Natasha Sega, and we are going to uh, moderate uh, the session. So, uh, as far as uh, today's webinar, you know, uh, we are going to uh, um, tackle issues of um, integrating uh, a gender uh, perspective into um, uh, STEM research, understanding sex, gender and intersectional analysis, but also mm, we'll know more about case studies. Um, we will hear about um, what uh, gender sensitive measures can be um, put forward by research funding organizations and uh, about the importance of um, joint uh, work between RPOs and RFOs. Um, so we have, we have um, uh, two presentations um, and three speakers from the um, GICO uh, and Aetna system projects. Uh, so uh, how we are going to, um, to work? 
the agenda is um, as follow um, a, a q and a session um, after the two presentations um, and um, uh, we will uh, finish by um, uh, quarter past uh, 12. we are usually on time <laughs> Um, technicalities, mm, just please uh, do not use the raise your hand functionality. The Q&A session will take place uh, via um, the um, uh, chat, via the Q&I uh, button. Please type your questions there um, and you can start typing your questions already in the, in, I mean, when the presentation, when our speakers are presenting. Um, and then we will pose them uh, the questions uh, during the, the Q&A. The chat uh, box is instead uh, just for uh, technicalities or to communicate uh, uh, with other attendees during the session. Uh, without uh, further ado, I will just introduce you our first uh, speaker, Brigitte Ratzer, uh, who is uh, head of Office for Gender Competence uh, at uh, Technical University in Vienne, uh, lecturer and researchers, uh, researcher in social uh, studies, feminist research uh, in science and technology, and uh, the GICO uh, project um, coordinator as well. Uh, Brigitte, please, uh, the floor is yours. I pretend that you can see my screen uh, for my presentation and hear yes. my voice. We okay. can. That's nice. So then, <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you to the uh, people of GE Academy uh, for organizing this webinar and having us here. My name is Brigitte Ratzer, so as uh, already said, I'm the coordinator of GICO project and I really very shortly will introduce you to this project. It's one of the uh, Science Within for Society uh, activities, so it's a coordination and support action and basically uh, we are asked to implement gender equality plans in our partner universities and to support our funding agencies in setting up gender equality measures uh, which we, you also will be informed later on. Duration is 48 months, we still have only four months to go so near to the end. Uh, and uh, just to have an overview on our partners, so universities uh, are all technical universities. This might be specific uh, in uh, comparison to other um, SWAFs projects. So it's Technical University Vienna, then it's uh, Universita di Reggio Calabria, Politecnia Krakowska, and uh, our colleagues from Politecnia in Catalonia. Then the two funding agencies that are full partners are the, our TACRA, Technologica Agentura Ceske, and the Viennese uh, Science and Technology Fund. We have three supporting partners, basically two supporting partners, which is Yellow Window and BNK, and one partner, GESIS, who is doing the evaluation of the project. There are some advisors, there are some observers as in many projects and as I already said, uh, you need not go through all the text just to give an idea. We are uh, implementing uh, tailor-made gender equality plans, we are implementing gender criteria to the RFOs. What we try to do is to have this kind of self-reflective learning environment where we, there is a learning from one each other because partners are in different stages of implementation and there is also uh, resistances at one or the other place and uh, so it's, it's good to have this kind of exchange. And we evaluate during the lifetime of the project so to be able to tackle problems that come up there. Um, I just want to draw to your attention to three of those work packages because for those who are not so familiar with the concepts of, of gender equality project, the current approach of um, the European Union is that uh, there is a threefold idea of how to tackle the gender equality issues. 
One is about uh, decision-making processes and bodies, so to have uh, equal representation of women and men and other genders may be <laughs> there. Um, then you have the idea of recruitment and career development for uh, female staff, uh, which is specifically difficult in the STEM field, as you might know, because they are already in the uh, in the studentship. There are uh, low percentages of women down to like 10% as we have in electrical engineering. So still things to do. And the third uh, pillar is then the gender dimension in research and teaching uh, that uh, should be addressed uh, within the gender equality plans. Okay, some advertising. Uh, our project as it is near to the end has already produced lots of uh, most probably interesting materials, so you might go to our website and see it there. I want to draw your attention specifically on the exhibition Gender and Research, because as we are talking about this topic, Gender and Research, I think this is a good material uh, for uh, all kinds of institutions and policy makers to get familiar with what the idea of Gender and Research is, and we provide this exhibition in nine different European languages, and it's just for download and uh, use however you want to set up such an exhibition. Get connected with us. Here we are. And here we jump into what basically I was asked to present today, the topic of uh, gender aspects in research content. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, to make clear what it is about how you can do it, and I'll provide you with some examples because uh, we think that uh, this topic is, is quite uh, comprehensive and it's, it's complex in some ways, and uh, it seems that it's easier to approach these uh, first steps with providing examples. Okay, so uh, what is gender in research? Basically, you have this kind of two dimensions of gender in research. One question, and that's the first question that all people put is, who is there? So uh, what we call head count, like counting the heads of men and women, seeing if there is equal representation and seeing if there are also equal opportunities for men and women in research. That's very important, but what we're gonna speak about today that's the second part, that's the part of what are we researching and how are we researching. So what are there gender aspects within the research content, within the development of uh, technologies and innovation uh, that should be considered? Uh, and uh, do we, at the end of the day, address with the products that we produce in, in science and technology uh, in, in STEM field, uh, both men's and women's realities? So, um, why do we do it? Because there are some assumptions, actually, that are, I think, very widespread. You can also find them on the Gender Innovations website. Uh, if you add gender, to research, so sex and gender analysis, uh, basically, uh, we expect that the excellent and quality of outcomes uh, is rising, so you're enhancing also the sustainability of your products. We also expect uh, that we add value to the society because uh, we make research more responsive to real social needs of all people and not just of one group. And last but not least, add value to businesses by developing new ideas, patents, and technology. So there's lots of reasons uh, to give. Uh, and for those who have been attending the webinar of last week, maybe uh, if we look through the classes um, of responsible research and innovation, uh, you might see that there are lots of uh, points that you can also see uh, with uh, different classes, like if you talk about excellence and quality and outcomes, this is about uh, designing products that uh, ha meet the needs of all people or many people. So this is actually about ethics and research integrity. Whom do you think about and who 
just uh, stays out and is not thought about. And it's also, if you think about the field of like medical research, uh, I think it's a, it's, it's a question of good research in a very basic sense uh, to include, for instance, male and female mice in, in, in your uh, research and not only do all your medical research with male uh, animals and then male persons. Um, responsive to social needs. This is something that I uh, would frame in, in, the, in terms of social justice, uh, because actually uh, having research and having research and innovation done uh, without considering the, the needs uh, and the problems that parts of uh, our society are facing uh, is just unjust because we are ex actually using taxpayers' money, so it's also my money and I want to be included in whatever uh, gets developed there. And last but not least, uh, having new ideas, patents and technology, so this is the transfer also to, to society, it's, it's about open science and it's about public engagement. So from my point of view, but I think maybe many gender researchers will have a similar view. Uh, if you start considering gender, you can from this point on uh, explore all those dimensions uh, that we would like to ask researchers to consider and to take care of. So it's, it's, it's I think, a very broad, uh, actually, approach. Okay. So, but how now do we do it? Basically, what we find is, uh, as we see more and more uh, funding agencies to ask uh, their applicants to include uh, sex and gender analysis or to include a gender aspect, there is, that there is a lot of confusion, actually. And what I really want to stress is, um, first of all, it's not about counting the heads of men and women, if you talk about gender in research, but it's also not about stereotyping. So what we very often see are things like this, it's like this, shrink it and pink it, make it small, make it pink, and then it might fit for women or for all women in the worst case, so you forget about this picture right now. Um, but be aware that this is really uh, problematic in, in, in approaching uh, gender aspects in research. So how would you tackle the problem? We would propose, and this is also in line with the Gender Innovations Project that basically a couple of weeks ago came up with a new report and there are also new sections on the website. Uh, uh, we strongly recommend to understand the concept of intersectionality. So if you design and if you uh, um, research on um, on science and technology fields, it's, it's uh, really important to understand this concept. So for whom are you designing? When you think about women, uh, it is really important that you ask which women exactly are you thinking about? Is it like young women, old women, rich women, poor women, or white women, or Asian women? And if you think about men and women, so uh, what are you in, uh, thinking about? Is it heterosexual people or also gay people? Or what about gender fluid people? So are you really uh, for designing for all of these people? And when you think about occupation, do you also think inclusive, like uh, considering male nurses or female construction workers? or left-handed uh, workers in, in the industry. So basically, does your design work across cultures, religions, incomes, races, uh, and geographic locations? So uh, sounds difficult, and uh, to be honest, sometimes it is difficult because what you usually see is if you develop uh, science and technology devices, um, and then you come to a stage where you uh, are thinking about the users or consumers, um, then you would use a, do usability studies. And of course, it gets more expensive and more time consuming to include more users and more uh, future consumers uh, to your uh, setting to figure out if it really fits for all or at least many people what you are designing uh, and what the exact needs of 
diverse people would be. Uh, and this is also something that the funding agencies actually have to consider that uh, in a way, if you introduce sex and gender analysis uh, in a sound and proper way, uh, things usually get more complicated and more expensive, but we are talking about science, so it might be complicated at some time. Okay, so um, I talked a lot about uh, what gender in research uh, theoretically is. I'd like to provide you with some examples to make it more visible and, and more uh, tangible. Uh, and I chose one example from, from the field of mobility and gender. Uh, so there is uh, lots and lots and lots of research actually for decades now uh, figuring out uh, mobility of men and women and everything that's concerned about mobility. And one thing that we find is um, that there are, if you're doing quantitative studies like uh, just uh, doing surveys about uh, mo mobility issues of men and women, you find out that they differ a lot. So women tend to have more trip chains, they have shorter distances, they very often or more often they use public transport, as you see here in the picture. Whereas compared to men, men uh, drive longer distances, have more linear trips, not these polygons that you find at the female side, um, and they more, more often use their private cars. So that's quite interesting because if you see this picture, you might come up with the idea that there is something within men and with women this, uh, that makes them uh, having very, very different mobility patterns and, and uh, that you find that women somehow are different than men and they tend to do these kind of things that you might see here. In fact, if you take a closer look, I uh, just put it here again, like the main differences between men and women. If you take a closer look, then the difference disappears uh, when you account for socioeconomic factors. So like if you do uh, construct twin pairs and uh, you have identic uh, males and females that are identically in all their uh, social surroundings, like single people, full-time working, no family, no uh, other obligations, then they most probably gonna have the same mobility patterns. And the same is also true if you have a single mother or single father with uh, like two or three children, uh, kindergarten, schools, uh, and the necessity also to uh, have the household done by yourself. So then most probably you're gonna ex uh, also show the same mobility patterns. So this, this is about uh, division of labor actually. So household duties and child care are the main factors influencing mobility patterns. And it's not about our sex, like being a man or being a woman. That's important to understand. And, but it's also important to understand if uh, gender roles are so uh, important in, in terms of the needs for mobility and, and how and what you are doing in, within your mobility life, then it's also very important to understand if you support uh, people in their current roles, this also means uh, that you support the current division of labor. On the other hand, uh, if you try to introduce uh, transportation systems or mobility devices that, that uh, would support different behavior or different um, uh, also uh, kinds of mobility. This might support people in getting out of this uh, very classic division of labor, but at the same day, uh, at the same uh, time, this might also uh, leave out people who are in such a classic situation and, and meet these very stereotypical uh, mobility patterns for their daily life. Okay, so this is about gender, but there is also something uh, with sex and mobility that I would like to share with you, uh, because uh, I think this uh, might help to understand uh, what the difference is between assigning um, patterns or assigning uh, facts uh, to people because of their sex or because uh, of their gender role. Uh, what is about sex is actually the safety in cars uh, and in, in the 
the private transport uh, because uh, when uh, cars were developed and, and the safety uh, research was developed, actually, at the very left side of, of the blue picture, you find the Sierra Sam. That's a, an average uh, dummy, car crash dummy. So uh, this is the 50% man, as it was also termed, and for lots and lots of years, all the simulations and all the uh, investigations in car security were made with this crash test dummy. Um, so, uh, providing security for people who are close to this model and not providing security to people who somehow differ. You then see at the next uh, picture, the, there was a family developed, so there's also a female and three uh, children of different size. And years and years later, like we're talking about three or four decades, even there was this uh, pregnant crash test dummy figuring out that the seat belt that we usually use with this three point mechanism is very dangerous to unborn babies. Uh, and then uh, the latest development was also an, an overweight crash test dummy, uh, considering that. Um, uh, it very much depends not only on your proportions in, in terms of size and, and heights, but also uh, on the distribution of bones and uh, tissues, uh, what happens to you in such a ca uh, car crash. Uh, you have read the numbers below, I think, uh, so we need not go into that uh, to wrap it up. For women, it's much more dangerous to drive in cars because they were left out for a long time and still are left out uh, from security research and also from uh, building in security in cars. Okay, so that's uh, gender and sex in mobility. We have provided a short video about that and there's also a literature review that, which is more comprehensive and and compiles all the research in this field. I just shortly want to jump into another topic because this gives still another perspective and this is about robots and gender. Um, you see a variety of robots here, so some of the devices, they look like uh, either animals or just like uh, discs or something, so not, not human-like, but there are robots that are built human-like and they're also intentionally built human-like, specifically if we expect them to interact with humans because the idea is that it is easier for us to interact with an uh, artificial device that somehow is similar to us and that we can easier understand what this device wants us to do or how we can interact. But what we find is that androids are performed very stereotypically. On the one hand, very stereotypically female, like Sophia and Erica. This is Sophia. Uh, and funny enough, that's just a fun fact, uh, that's the first robot to have been given a citizenship, and interesting enough, the citizenship of Saudi Arabia. But she's a female robot. And this is Erica, she and, and with her inventor, Mr. Ishiguro. Both devices, and you can, uh, if you search the internet, you find lots and lots of video clips about them and with them, uh, behaving quite stereotypically female, actually, as compared to physical robots like Hermes uh, and Atlas. This is Hermes. He was developed at the MIT, and if you see the team of developers, you might uh, uh, understand uh, what the problem of very uh, uh, homogeneous teams actually is. And it's quite interesting to see actually how small he is then, as compared to the first picture. Uh, this is Atlas. Uh, so the two left figures are the Atlas figures, and then there is a couple of um, devices that's uh, more built like animals actually. But what you see in all those devices is a very, very stereotypical uh, picture of male strength uh, and power. Uh, and just to wrap it quickly, quickly up, what we know from the humanities and the social sciences is that first of all, we build social relationships with seemingly autonomous devices even if it's this vacuum cleaner that just looks like a disc, 
because uh, we tend to understand that something that seems to be or move autonomous um, is either close to an animal, so like the vacuum cleaner, could, you could uh, deal with it like with your cat, uh, but uh, the closer it is to human being, the more we would uh, understand that this is kind of human being and then uh, giving these robots a gender or something that we identify as one gender changes our social and cultural understanding of gender. So having a world full of very nice, very stereotypic and very um, uh, keen and, and neat uh, female androids might change our perception of what it means to be a woman as compared to having the, a world full of those Hermes and Atlas uh, devices also might change our idea of what it means to be a man or male. Okay, there is another video about that and also a com more comprehensive literature review about robots actually, not mobility, <laughs> it says here. Uh, and uh, to come to an end, I would just uh, point out that uh, not integrating gender into research uh, simply is discrimination. But there are different discriminations, uh, dimensions of discrimination actually if you ignore gender in research and this ranges from simply being uh, sort of excluded uh, like uh, maybe you have heard about these voice recognition systems that only recognize male voices and do not recognize female voices so they simply wouldn't work for you if you're a woman or smartphones that are too big to be used with small hands, things like that. Um, it's also about inferiority. So uh, that's a bit more uh, risky then. Uh, you can use it, but it doesn't fit. So there is, for instance, uh, safety equipment with sensors. So those new uh, devices that variables actually that you can use uh, and that are, uh, only provided actually for males basically for for average male persons so if you use it as a as a woman like if you're a member of a fire brigade or things like that you might find yourself uh, dressed up in a way that is not only supporting you not but uh, maybe also hindering you to make certain movements so that's close to dangerous so we are at the next category uh, being ignored and thereby being at risk. I think the most uh, well-known examples are from medicine, like being ignored, having a heart attack because it's only um, surveyed with, with male probands, or this car crash example that I gave you before, uh, this also uh, puts you at risk. And then uh, the problem of getting stuck in a role that is inappropriate, like uh, we've seen with the robots, that uh, tend to strongly stereotype and, and exaggerate male and female uh, roles. Okay, so if you want to know more, get connected with us and our channels. Thank you very much and waiting for your questions and for the discussion. Thanks a lot. Uh... Thanks a lot, uh, Birgit, for your uh, super interesting uh, presentation. Uh, let me just um, now um, uh, introduce you our next speakers. As we mentioned, we will now look into uh, how uh, research funding organizations can uh, promote actions to um, uh, to foster the integration of uh, gender as a dimension in research content and therefore uh, Marcel Krauss and Donia uh, Lassinger from um, uh, RP, R RFOs will, um, uh, will tell us uh, how to. Uh, Marcel Krauss is um, a funding scheme designer um, and evaluator at the technology agency of the uh, Czech Republic. Um, and Donia Lassinger uh, is a Deputy uh, Managing Director of the Vienna Science and Technology Funds. So experience from uh, two different RFOs and two different countries as well. Uh, thank you both and the floor uh, is yours. 
Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, let me please share my screen first. And to start with um, our presentation, which we are actually sharing together with Tonya Walvinger and the later stage. So, uh, my name is Marcel Kraus, and I am representing here the Technology Agency of the Czech Republic and, of course, JECO project. The agency is focused on supporting applied research in uh, all range of scientific uh, subjects, STEM, social sciences, humanities, biotechnology, uh, transport, energy, etc. And we are uh, redistributing public money, national uh, resources for a targeted uh, support of research. Uh, our agency is actually involved in the yeah, RRI principles uh, in three projects, which uh, overlaps in a certain extent, and the flagship of gender sensitive activities uh, and measures is uh, actually JECO projects focusing on gender equality in research, and we uh, are responsible for the role of research funders in the gender related uh, changes at our POs, research performing organizations. Uh, concerning the RRI principles, we can use the you know, advantages from other two projects, New Horizon or ProEthics. Uh, the main question for my contribution for the next 10 minutes is uh, what is the relationship between RFO and gender equality in RRI? Uh, gender equality doesn't stay alone. It's connected with the ethics, open science, participation, education, governance, etc. As uh, already Brigitte mentioned in previous presentation. And uh, I would like to offer you three thoughts about the relationship between RRI and gender sensitivity and R RFOs. Um, uh, realities. The first is uh, IFOs have an influence on career development of researchers yeah? in supported or even unsupported uh, projects proposals. The second thought, uh, IFOs have an impact on the quality of society's lives through supported projects and, and uh, yeah, research products which might have an impact on the society. And the last one, the third one, IFOs have an impact on gender sensitivity and gender sensitive culture in the whole research ecosystem where they are operating. So let's come to the first topic. The first idea relates to gender diversity of research team. Yeah, or gender balance, gender equality in the team's composition. Uh, this includes uh, supporting women in, in uh, leading positions, yeah, the principal, female principal investigators too. And why? Because in yeah, most EU countries, yeah, EU 28 or 27 countries, the female researchers are underrepresented, especially in STEM subjects or IT. And this means, of course, uh, not only loss for talent uh, of talent uh, or innovation potential for society and uh, at the end for yeah, social economic life. Our measures at the technology agency focusing on two areas in this regard, yeah, the research team. First, uh, the research team's gender diversity is a Become, uh, is becoming part of evaluation of project proposals. In uh, two programs, Zeta, ETA. Zeta is program for junior researchers. ETA is program for social sciences and humanities. And we positively consider it when the project is led by female principal investigator. Uh, we have three possibilities how to uh, positive consider it. First is uh, providing with a certain number of extra points for the female principal investigators in the project proposals evaluation, or we instruct uh, opponents or reviewers 
that the gender diverse team and female in leading positions is possible to consider on a positive way when evaluating projects, or uh, we offer a possibility to, to give uh, yeah, the priority in the final order of supported projects. When, um, yeah, when, the, when the point score is near to the limit of relevant course budget. So we introduce those, uh, those measures in order to help researchers and research funding organizations to achieve better, greater gender equality in, in research. Second thought, uh, gender dimension of research. We heard it uh, already in previous presentation of Brigitte. Uh, yeah, I thought have, have, have an impact on the quality of life because they are providing uh, with support of you know, researchers, uh, research uh, performing organizations. So we need to have a focus on what actually, what we are supporting and what uh, impact it might, might have on people's life. So we introduced new evolution criteria, gender dimension in research and innovation content. We are maybe the first research funders in, uh, uh, count, in, uh, in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, which are trying to introduce this kind of view on the quality of uh, research uh, projects proposals. Uh, what does it mean? We introduced uh, this criterion in evaluation process. So reviewers, reporters, panelists, jury members needs to, uh, to deal with uh, this, this point of view or this, this prism on the project's uh, evaluation. We have a new text box in online application form where it's possible to describe the, the extent of gender relevance of the topic. Of course, not each project proposal or project topic is relevant, but uh, even if it is not, we would like to know why uh, the researchers hold this position, why it is not relevant. We have new instruction in course documentation, of course, and uh, we developed guidelines for, uh, for help, to help the researchers and evaluators how to integrate the gender dimension in the content of research and innovation. And the last thought <laughs> relates with, with the responsibility of RFOs for the whole research ecosystem. Uh, we cannot make researchers responsible for the whole changes which made, which uh, can be or has to be done in a research performing organizations. We have to find a way how to address research performing organizations on the man managerial level. Yeah? That's why we are focusing not only on the researchers' responsibilities, but on the responsibilities of research performing organizations too. For example, we provide uh, bonuses for advanced HR environment and gender sensitive culture at uh, RPOs and other beneficiaries. For example, we provide higher flat rate or more points in evaluation when we get the proof that the beneficiary, the RPO, uh, have, for example, HR excellence in research award or gender equality plan in place or certification for gender pay gap. Yeah, those all uh, are, um, are reasons for whether a higher point for evaluation of project proposals when the organization is involved in or higher flat rate. We consider the career breaks in evaluation. We, don't require a certain uh, uh, age limit of uh, researchers' track record, for example, not older than five years. No, we uh, leave it open and on the researchers, uh, on the researchers' uh, ability to prove their, their expertise. And there is a maximum limit of five research projects or five papers per, per researchers. 
Why? Because those who experienced career breaks, they don't have so much track, so big track record to choose the best one uh, papers or projects from uh, and those we try to, to bring uh, yeah, equal, equal positions, equal conditions for men and women. Those breaks could be, uh, for example, parental leave or, or long-term illness, etc. And we consider work-life balance expenditures as eligible. Work-life balance expenditures related with the projects sup uh, supported from us are eligible. There is one condition, it has to be involved in the internal directives of the research uh, performing organizations. Okay, I hope I'm still in, in time. <laughs> uh, uh, the conclusion, Thatcher Technology Agency of the Czech Republic is responsible for redistribution of public resources. What does it mean? It means that those resources are actually made up by uh, with the whole society as a whole, from men and women and other groups. So men and women and other groups should benefit equally from the way public resources are spent, especially when they are spent for the research development and innovation activities. And the relationship between RFO's principles and RRI principles uh, overlaps a lot, yeah? participation, ethics, governance, education, gender equality. It overlaps uh, even to even with the principles of IFOs in terms of career development, public resources redistribution, or societal impacts of research on people's life. In the uh, red, there is a list of our measures which, uh, which are focusing on on the gender equality in research. So you can have a look at, at this advance. And I think that I would stop at this moment and give the floor to my colleague, uh, Donia Lazinger. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Marcel. And also thanks to everyone for the invitation. And um, actually, I guess uh, because time is running, um, we will just uh, jump to the to the next slide and even the one further because and Marcel, I hope that you can click click me through. Exactly, and we can just jump to the next one so that we don't um, don't um, lose too much time. Maybe just uh, to understand also my my next explanations and who we are, because we're a little bit different um, organization than what Marcel just, uh, Marcel just uh, explained. And Marcel, maybe you can go to the next slide, um, is we are a very small organization and also small are compared to Marcel's organization. And also we are a private one, a nonprofit organization. Um, and because we're uh, uh, this small and private, we also have like maybe a different focus and hopefully bring it in. Um, what we are doing is we try to pro promote a basic research, also maybe a little bit different from Marcel's organization, who is more also on the applied side, which made it sometimes a little bit difficult for us uh, to discuss gender, but I will come to that later. And uh, we are a regional or a local actor. So we are a funding organization who operates mainly in Vienna. And I also included the kind of budget that we have spent since 2003 to give you an overlook how big we are and, and, and what we're doing. So what we are doing in our mission, and this is maybe important also to stress then what our understanding of gender is uh, further, is uh, we are operating in a niche. So we said, okay, we wanna fund top scientific research in Vienna. And we do that by providing large substantial fan, funds for researchers here to, so that they can work in projects but also to bring researchers in from abroad so that they can bring in their knowledge and their expertise. And we do that by competitive calls. So we have an international uh, call system um, where, research, where yeah, researchers and reviewers really look on the proposals that come from Viennese researchers. 
And to give you an impression, we only have, or only, but according to our budget, we have three calls per year and around 15 projects and two people that we can fund with our money. So also seeing on the next slide, you see also we do that not in all kinds of fields. We have thematic programs, we have thematic priorities, and you can see them depicted here. So we really had to pick certain fields that we would like to spend our money in, and we do that by also a quite a small selection of instruments. And now we'll get to the next uh, slide and I show you how about us and how we understand gender equality. So the initial situation, so before we joined GECO uh, was we had individual measures already in place, but we had no systematic approach. And I could definitely say now after nearly four years that GECO really boosted us in this uh, direction to kind of get this exchange and also to have the time to spend to spend thoughts on, on gender and, and what we could do and how we can implement it. So this was really, really a, a very nice thing that we also could think about what the role of RFOs is and also in exchange with RPOs. So always to see, okay, what do they need? What can we do? What could every partner do? And how to find now an, a nice way to, to implement gender dimension in funding. Uh, so what we did, um, maybe just to quickly stress, uh, what was very useful, we also made quite an, um, maybe you could go back, uh, Marcel, sorry. Uh, we did, did also a quite um, co large collection analysis of other RFOs and what they are doing in uh, gender equality, which was very useful. And we took that and adapted to, to our own context and then uh, we implemented uh, the, these things and tried it out in a trial. And now it's really kind of ex uh, established. And I will go into more details now on the next slide. Maybe about the role of RFOs in general, before we come to the role of RFOs and gender equality or gender mainstreaming. Um, our understanding of or what, I, what we can do is our mission is to support excellent scientific research in Vienna in these thematic priorities. And as we are small, we are, and this is an advantage, we are flexible, but we are always embedded in a wider context, which means we have the scientific community in Vienna, we have a regional policy dialogue, we have national, international networks, we have very diverse stakeholders, which is very good because we get a lot of things and impressions, but on the other side, we have to balance them. So what we and what our role is, is we're also constant aware and evaluating what is going out there and what is kind of now the status quo and what we should adapt and could adapt to our own standards and what is really necessary for our improvement. So, for example, we do regular evaluations about our programs. For, uh, we are in constant exchange with the outer world. We're in constant exchange with RPOs as well. And... Thanks God, we are participating in larger projects like in GECO and other EU projects. Um, and then out of this, uh, we are trying to prioritize and to, to implement some changes also to support some structural and cultural changes in the scientific context. They also have to be quite uh, small as we're also small, but we are trying to experiment a little bit. We, we for example, once we wanted to help researchers who are more in the basic side to make a first step into the more applied side. So we developed a small funding scheme uh, that they can try it out, just to give an example. Or for example, we saw that there was a problem years back with the tenure system in Austria. So we tried in one program really to get this tenure, um, ten, uh, tenure perspective into one funding program and together with the RPOs developed a mechanism and a structure to get it more going. And now it's really standard since some years, just to give you some examples. Now jumping to what the role uh, in, in gender equality is, and on the next slide uh, is really uh, one thing, and I really want to point it out, to learn from others. Uh, we are normally not the front runners, as we're quite small and according to the size, but we try to always implement the standard who is out there. And uh, an important aspect, as we see that gender equality and gender mainstreaming is unfortunately not where it should be. We also would like to kind of uh, bring in and push forward the changes 
um, in, in the wider context and to adapt to that. So what did we change? And Marcel already said a few things that we all also did. Um, first of all, we said that we were, we were um, setting in a, a monitoring with, with more detail to, to get to know what the status quo actually is. We also made an awareness raising internally, internally, which was sometimes not that easy because also employees thought that basic research does not have any gender perspective, which, so this was a very important step to get everyone on board. Um, we also installed a new criteria, also what Marcel uh, mentioned, not only the headcount as Brigitte uh, mentioned before, but also in content. And we did ex extensive information uh, with our applicants to let them know that this change is now in place. But again, I have to, to add that already other funding organizations, and I will come back to that, already did that. So it was easier because applicants already were quite used to it in other contexts. And what we also did internally, we were informing our juries and we included a jury, we included a competence in our jury, which means we also selected a jury member who also has gender mainstreaming and gender equality expertise. And this was very helpful in selecting the, the proposal and um, balancing also the gender perspective there and gender in context. So maybe to, to, to deepen a little bit some points that I already mentioned uh, in the next slide is what we really had to do first was building up internal knowledge and a gender-friendly culture internally. So we, first of all, we were number crunching and really looking out what numbers do we have. Um, we, we needed evidence that there is need for action. So we really analyzed everything and looked at different stages of our calls and of our call organization. And we also analyzed sex disaggregated data in different, different indicators. And one of my colleagues, Elizabeth, she really did that in detail to, to know what, what is actually going on internally. But we also um, looked what is going out from a, with other RFOs and what are they doing. And for that, this kind of best practice selection was very helpful. Then we had a lot of internal discussions. We had awareness raising workshops and trainings that were very important to get everyone on board because, because you can imagine we are only a few people, we're eight people. So uh, it's easy to kind of um, grab them, but if they have very strong opinion, then it's maybe not so easy to do that. So this was very an intense um, thing to do, but um, it was very fruitful. We also kind of did a very intensive analysis uh, of other organization and then really started. So this was important to implement and to start at a certain angle and to try to try things out. What is really, what was really important for us is to adapt the lessons learned that we see to our own context. As I mentioned before, we are quite different from Marcel's organization, the legal status, we are private, not public. So we have private money and not public money. We are quite, small size in the funding volumes, but also in our structures. For example, we don't have this one person who is responsible for gender mainstreaming and nothing else. It is more, we are doing it and uh, which, yeah, sometimes make it hard because you don't have so much time you can spend on it. Um, and then about the implementation, what I already mentioned, it was really about uh, identifying a window of opportunity and to really start, you know, to make a pilot initiative and even if it's not perfect, just to start and then have this learning by doing and, um, you know, not, not inventing something which was already there and to balance kind of between overanalyzing and evidence and perfectionism and pragmatism. And I think this, we really, really did this. And also we kind of try to sustain it and to keep colleagues informed, to keep our boards informed and to report about success stories. So this was really, really important. And just to get to an end, because we are actually really running out of time, um, a small kind of lessons learned from, from our side and what kind of role we can play, even when we're small, is uh, the plus side was really we're a private organization. I mean, we have a board of directors and an advisory board, but still we have fewer restrictions than public RFOs and maybe are a little bit more flexible. 
uh, we don't have to be a first mover because other organizations have passed the way and uh, which is very fruitful, we're embedded in very different groups. For example, the exchange with RF RPOs that I mentioned. And we had a, a, a very um, holistic approach. So we implemented the action in a whole call and really thought it through from the beginning until the end when we select the people and we, we talk to them afterwards. So we really did it all over. Maybe the, the, the minus side, uh, private means also not having to fulfill the public requirements. So example is the quota. We, we don't have to do it. This is maybe a, um, a disadvantage. Uh, so we also are a small organization, which means there is little room for bigger structures. For example, one dedicated person or a gender equality office, not possible. Um, and it's depending on the individual engagement of certain people to really push it forward. But definitely this uh, project was very helpful. And with this, actually, I would like to come to an end. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward for your questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Donia, as well. Uh, your, your presentation was uh, really interesting uh, and thoughtful. Um, reflecting on, on, on your experience uh, throughout the, the GICO uh, project. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think overall uh, we have a lot to discuss, um, starting from the um, uh, integration of gender uh, in research content. It was very nice to hear from uh, Brigitte, her straightforward focus on uh, the impact of not doing it, right? Uh, so uh, in terms of um, ignoring, excluding or stereotyping um, users and or potential users of technologies. And then um, we had the opportunity to uh, to learn how this can really embed it in the work of uh, research funding organizations. Personally, I was very curious to, uh, to know um, uh, how your constituencies uh, reacted to the changes, meaning both the applicants uh, and um, uh, the, the, the research performing organizations, uh, but also uh, your um, colleagues, the evaluators, and whether and how you faced any, any resistances uh, from any of, of uh, these um, uh, stakeholders. Uh, but uh, we also have um, several uh, questions uh, from our uh, from from our audience. Uh, so it's just up to now where we want to start from. <laughs> um, uh, I see that on the uh, on the um, uh, gender dimension um, uh, in research content, we have. Uh, question from um, from Jana, uh, who is um, asking, uh, can you see her question uh, on the screen, right? Um, yeah, uh, how this can be promoted as ethical agenda and whether there is, um, uh, there are good practices uh, in ethical code for researchers. So maybe we can start from, from here. Okay, I, I try my best because uh, actually I'm not familiar with ethical codes and, and, and the technicality uh, of how they are framed and what is written in there. But uh, just to approach it from what I think about what should be at least included in something that is called an ethical code is uh, that you should not leave anyone behind like this motto also from the united nations leave no one behind you can't do research uh, on uh, just arbitrarily taking groups of uh, either people or animals or whatever you take and just leave the others out like you would not leave out handicapped people or lgbtqi people and obviously not half of the population, which is women. Uh, so this is kind of ridiculous in this uh, Marcel already stressed uh, the, in the STEM field, we are researching uh, and developing things that are about the quality of our lives. So this is uh, not something that is like nice to have uh, and, and just half of the population might have it or 
not even half because if you do it very stereotypically it usually fits just some of them um, and uh, at the end of the day, I mean, it's taxpayers' money, it's my money, it goes there uh, to develop the society and to make a flourishing and uh, progressive society. Uh, in <laughs> Lately, in, in, in line with, with our natural environment, which also was left out for a long time. Uh, but I think uh, these are the principles that need to be entered into a, such an ethical code uh, that uh, should tackle the, the basic idea that if you do research, I would not, uh, I mean, I would distinguish between basic research and applied research. It's different for basic research. I think leave them alone and let them think about whatever they want to think about and let's see what comes up there. For applied research, it's different because you know uh, this, the surrounding where you are uh, building it in, you know the users, consumers, people who are uh, in a way affected. Uh, so you can consider them and their needs and priorities. So I think that's the very, uh, yeah, but um, actually I cannot really translate it into something that looks like an ethical code because I'm not so familiar with this concept. Thank you, uh, Brigitte. It would be interesting to know uh, whether there are good practices uh, on that respect, because it would be right, uh, a nice example of uh, mainstreaming gender into uh, something which is more RRI practice uh, to to stay within the the, the framework of uh, of the of our two uh, two webinars. Actually, just one more sentence. Uh, I used to have a colleague who is a really distinguished uh, ethics expert, and we had lots of discussions about similarities and differences, and what would be like the, the, the crossroad, the junction of, of gender equality and, and ethics. Uh, and we always came up with uh, social justice, actually. That is where the concepts meet. If you think about social justice, uh, so this is something that I've seen that the Ethna project added actually to, to the list of uh, topics of RRI. I think that that's, uh, that's the crucial point. Yeah, sure, I agree. Um, we have then um, one question for um, Mar Marcel, uh, which is um, to what extent you can assess the difference, assess the difference between uh, pure uh, proclamation policies and reality when it comes to gender um, applied uh, for funding. Any tools in place uh, for this? Yes, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, actually, we have uh, in, uh, yeah, invented or designed one tool how to uh, calculate the headcount in terms of gender equality for one program, for Zeta program for young uh, researchers or junior researchers. This program has been focused uh, on both career development and uh, equal opportunity of men and women uh, in, in the applied research. Uh, we call it gender metrics. I can maybe provide you with the link to, to, to the document. Gender metrics is uh, yeah, simply based on, on the ratio of uh, present uh, men and women in the research team. There is a positive consideration when the gender diversity is uh, uh, yeah, greater than 30 percent and the other positive consideration when the project is led by female principal investigators so please uh, wait a minute we'll find a link and provide you with, with the link to your uh, question thanks a lot uh... Uh, I also think that uh, that uh, uh, your um, um, your uh, your reference to certification programs was also um, an additional uh, way uh, for 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 you to um, to really try to assess whether um, research performing organizations have uh, consistent uh, policies in place, right? Um, yeah, so it's, it's, 
Mm. That's true. Uh, sorry for interrupting you. That's true. Uh, we have a very positive uh, experience with mixing different kind of measures or approaches or incentives or bonuses in this regard. Uh, so we, we are not relying on just one uh, one measure uh, by headcount. Yeah, it's, it would uh, not be sustainable. So yeah, having a variety of, of uh, uh, indicators to assess this. Yes, and now Thank in other, other pro uh, programs we are trying to bear in mind that there are different ratios uh, of men and women in a different scientific subject. So the evaluators are instructed that it should be taken in account when evaluating gender diversity in the research. Right, thank you. We have an additional uh, question actually, which is more of a comment in the, um, in the chat box from Colleen, uh, who is um, uh, in a way pointing at um, uh, funding for female researchers or for researchers to do research on gender equality uh, topics um, as, as, a, as a potential measure. Um, how do you uh, do you consider this? Uh, do you have any such measures in, in place? Oops. I jump in before my colleagues from the funding agencies uh, get the word. Uh, from, a, from the viewpoint of a, a university, this is the strongest, strongest thing that you can do to have funding agencies who force the researchers focus on gender in research, like in the content, and also who look at the balance of, of the research teams. Because I can talk and talk for days and nights as these other topics also, and nothing would happen but follow the money. If it's, if it's about the money, then everybody suddenly will understand why, what's the benefit and why you have to do it. Or at least, even if they complain, they're going to do it. Maybe I can just jump in because we had very intense discussions about exactly this this topic <laughs> and I can remember. Um, yes, um, just from our perspective, as we're quite small, um, as I tried to point out, we also have quite a lot of other goals that we want to reach and we also have to balance them. Uh, I mentioned before the career in general, you know, the career perspective to really get a tenure perspective or a be it a... Uh, relevance for society re-impact so we are always kind of struggling with our money that we have to make kind of the best um, um, funding scheme and the best instrument um, yeah I just I just stop there because um, um, but what we definitely do and what Brigitte just said is that we are more aware and more counting and looking at the numbers and more looking what's out there more like what is normal kind of in these research research field or what can be done so we, this awareness I think is the first step. Thank you very much Donia. Um, I think we are uh... Um, close to uh, conclude our our webinar. So from my side, I would just thank you all. Thank thank the the GICO project and the Etna project, Etna system project, and uh, give the floor to Brigitte for uh, the final wrap up and conclusions. Actually, I have the impression that everything is already said. But uh, also from my side, thank you. Uh, all the partners of the two sister projects, this is Ethno Systems uh, and GE Academy, uh, for making this possible and for organizing it and, and for setting up such a uh, nice surrounding that now leads us to this kind of webinar that will live on even uh, if we cannot meet and if uh, times are difficult right now, I think it's a very valuable resource that uh, has been created right now. Um, and still, I mean, as, as, as the gender researcher, from my point of view, uh, the RRI um, agenda is something that in a way is included if you do really sound and proper uh, gender uh, research and, and analysis. And in terms of approaching uh, institutions uh, and uh, organizations that are producing research, uh, 
and and ask them for this kind of uh, criteria to fulfill them is uh, our colleagues from the RRI project are pointing out. Um, I think it's 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 also here like you can nearly take each of those topics and from this point of view develop all the others uh, because uh, public engagement would include some kind of uh, idea of, about uh, ethics and, and research integrity as well as open science would uh, and both are somehow interacting with this gender equality and the idea of whom to include and in, in what way uh, to also value uh, different knowledge and other people. Uh, so I would not see any um, thing that that would hinder us to cooperate. It's it's just that um, as the seeing the gender equality issues are already very complex. I really uh, admire the colleagues who are in addition to gender equality also dealing with all the other um, issues and, and and topics that are included in the. Uh, RRI uh, concept actually, uh, but if you really want to make uh, sound and nice and proper and reliable and sustainable research, actually you have to. So this is about good research at the end of the day. So then thank you uh, all of you who participated here and who contributed, all the colleagues from the last webinar who uh, explained to us the RRI concept and I hand back to Natasha for the final sentences. Is it? <laughs> yes, just a final word from my side. Thank you all. It was really interesting and also all the participants for the discussion that uh, we have. I just want to briefly mention that you will receive an exit questionnaire when you will close this uh, window, either today or tomorrow in the follow-up email, together with all the links that our speakers uh, show in, the, in their presentation. Thank you all also from my side and have a nice uh, day. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.